so uh, this is the 11th lecture and now uh, dr sunil parek is with us so before we start i'll give you a short introduction he is a, a distinguished scholar in the field of infectious diseases uh, with a particular focus on translational studies on malaria in sub saharan africa he did his md from johns hopkins university school of medicine and uh, which includes residency training in infectious diseases at the Beth Israel Deconsens Medical Center, Boston. Uh, subsequently, he joined University of California, San Francisco for his infectious disease fellowship. He earned master's degree in public health from UC Berkeley. Uh, and uh, since 2012, he's, he has been affiliated with the Department of Epidemiology of Microbial Disease at Yale School of Public Health. His groundbreaking research projects in vulnerable population in African states such as Uganda, uh, Burkina Faso, and Nigeria have focused on anti-malarial therapies. Uh, his exceptional achievement uh, in the field of infectious disease have earned him a well-deserved reputation uh, as a leading authority in the study of malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. And today, he's, uh, the title of his talk is Optimizing Anti-Malaria Regimen to Maximize Efficacy and Limit Resistance in Africa. So with this, without any further delay, I welcome Dr. Sunil Parekh. It's truly an honor to be uh, presenting um, uh, in front of uh, NIMR and uh, rest of colleagues around India. Um, uh, so really a pleasure, and I've, I've had a chance to look at some of the previous presentations, and, and it really has been an incredible lecture series, and I'm honored to be uh, one of the speakers. So thank you very much, um, uh, and also for the generous introduction. Uh, as Dr. Sharma said, I am a uh, associate professor at the Yale School of Public Health and Medicine, and I'm a practicing infectious diseases physician. Uh, but really spend the bulk of my time doing research in Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, I'd like to just tell you a bit about the challenges that we face in Sub-Saharan Africa, which unfortunately is, is increasing um, really uh, year to year instead of improving. Uh, and really um, hope this stimulates folks in the audience to, to think about novel ways that we may address the challenges with treatment and prevention in the continent. So um, I think this, these numbers at least have been uh, uh, probably shown in previous presentations, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the current state of malaria globally. Um, currently, we have about 247 million cases, at least last reported in 2021. What I think is sobering is that uh, our numbers peaked at around 2003, we had thought, um, and um, the burden was around 211 million in 2015. So if you compare from then to now, there's been essentially no progress and, and perhaps even uh, some worsening in the previous several years. Mortality has similarly been a difficult story in that we have reported at least 619,000 cases or estimated uh, in 2021. And again, that is an increase from what we saw in 2019 with a burden of 409,000. The highest burden uh, is really, you know, I think traditionally we all say children under five, but I think as we're seeing in, in several countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, the, the burden is, is shifting um, to include older age groups as well. So while under fives do represent in most settings the highest risk, we're seeing school-aged children make up a bulk uh, of, or a larger proportion of the numbers of cases than we had in previously. Deaths are uh, still concentrated in the youngest, uh, but I'd say 95% or so of the total cases and deaths occur in, in the um, uh, WHO African region. There are four countries in particular that account for about half of the global estimates, Nigeria, DRC, Uganda, and Mozambique. And, and this is a pie chart here on the right, which shows I just highlighted the three countries I work in, which are Uganda, Burkina Faso, and Cameroon. And I highlight them mainly to just show that it, I, you know, I have a view of malaria that uh, may differ from a lot of others and that I work in extremely high burden settings. So between these three places, we account for about 10% of the global burden of malaria. 
this is just a line chart showing the, the overall number of cases over time. And if you can kind of see, of course, um, visually, quite apparent that the numbers of cases over the last, uh, really since 2015, has either stagnated or, or even increased in certain years. Uh, and, and really frustrating given particularly the numerous numbers of measures that we've undertaken in the last 15, 20 years to combat this disease. And, and certainly the most um, effort and, and financing that we really had um, in, in recent memory. And despite this, we're seeing these increases. So this is from the Malaria Atlas project, just showing the uh, uh, falciparum uh, distribution and burden in terms of uh, prevalence in those two to 10 years old on the top and then Vivax down below. I know the colors are a bit harder to see, but um, uh, the reddish colors represent the high, highest endemic areas. Um, with orange represent lowering, uh, representing lower incidence or lower prevalence areas. And you can see Sub-Saharan Africa has areas that um, approach with the really red, most red areas um, uh, are places where the parasite prevalence can exceed greater than 80%. So Central West Africa, extremely, extremely uh, intense transmission, uh, intense transmission. And in India, you can see, and again, uh, the colors are a bit, may, maybe not projecting that well, but uh, you have a bit of a mix, of course, of falciparum and vivax. And in fact, as we know, um, if you go outside of Africa, about half of the burden uh, is vivax and half falciparum. But in sub-Saharan Africa, overwhelmingly um, uh, falciparum. But I will say uh, data from uh, many groups, including our own, have uncovered sites within Sub-Saharan Africa that have surprisingly high um, numbers of vivax, as well as other species. Um, so how do we combat um, and control the disease? This is a, a nice figure from JAMA this year uh, that focused on the ca cases uh, and, and management of malaria in the US. But this finger, I think, really is comprehensive. You know, we have multiple different methods to prevent disease from bed nets, which have probably provided the, the largest uh, reductions in malaria in the last 15 to 20 years. Um, we have chemoprophylaxis, uh, and thankfully we have two different um, types of vaccines essentially targeting the same, same uh, CSP locus. But really the bulk of our efforts um, and uh, 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 in terms of drugs have really focused on the treatment and the treatment in particular of the blood stages. Um, the only treatment, as, as probably all of you know in the audience, the only treatment that we have really to effectively treat any liver stages are the eight aminoquinolines, uh, primaquin, and most recently tofenaquin. Um, Atovaquone progonal, which is used uh, mostly for prophylaxis in travelers, but does have some use in some locations uh, to treat uh, disease, does have some liver stage activity. But really, all the other drugs that we have largely focus on the blood stage cycle when densities can reach really their highest in the human um, throughout its life cycle. Africa also presents multiple other challenges, and I think this, uh, you know, work done by modelers. Um, uh, spatial modelers, climate modelers are really helping us understand some of the uh, larger variations in uh, endemicity within Africa. And I think this is a nice um, uh, map here on the left, which attempts to show the transmission patterns of malaria in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the red regions are areas that are highly seasonal, which means that malaria transmission may largely be occurring in um, uh, in the span of just a few months. And then you have the yellow regions, which are seasonal, um, which may uh, entail transmission occurring uh, approximately in a three to five month time span, et cetera. So with this kind of diverse uh, uh, climatology and epidemiology, uh, the measures that we take vary tremendously, or at least we need to be varying them in a more finer scale approach than we are currently doing um, uh, 
One biggest example, which has been going on for about 10 years now, is seasonal mal malaria chemo prevention on the right, which shows, um, which is the use of uh, predominantly now almost exclusively amodiaquine together with sulfadoxine paramethamine given monthly to children three to 59 months of age during the rainy season. And you can see in the lower right that the numbers of cycles that you use this drug uh, varies depending on the length of the transmission season. So a lot of challenges that are pre um, presented just with the varying epidemiology that can be present even within um, uh, an individual country. And this heterogeneity can increase even at finer scales. Another big challenge, um, I think, is, is one uh, just in terms of sheer parasite numbers. And, uh, you know, for all infectious diseases, what we like to do is think about bottlenecks in parasite or virus or bacterial development and tar try to target those pathogens at a time when their numbers are smallest. Um, and that is, for obvious reasons, it's easier for the drug or vaccine or whatever the intervention is to, to be successful with a lower burden. Um, but also uh, probably helps to reduce the chances for resistance emergence just because the burden itself overall is lower. However, as I mentioned before, all of our drugs currently uh, essentially target the blood stages where we're asking these drugs to do uh, really a significant amount of work in, in that the average individual when they present with parasitemia uh, with symptomatic disease at least in sub-Saharan Africa, they're often at 10 to the 11th parasites per microliter, or 10 to the 11th parasites total, um, which again is a significant challenge for any any, any of our therapies to, to be successful against. So uh, how does malaria present, um, you know, uh, after the infectious mosquito bite? And, uh, these exact numbers of folks that fall into these different buckets is is under debate. Obviously, we have numbers for uncomplicated malaria and mortality, um, but the biggest bulk of individuals uh, in endemic areas are are likely asymptomatically infected. Um, and I point this out mainly because it's yet another challenge in that. With current diagnostics, such as uh, peripheral blood smear and rapid diagnostic tests, the average um, parasitemia that needs to be present in order to detect it is about 10 to the seventh parasites. Um, so we leave an incredible burden of disease undetected um, uh, out there in the, in, uh, in the community. So uh, really want to focus this talk on uncomplicated malaria. And these are the options that are currently present in the WHO guidelines. These are the artemisinin-based combination therapies. And you can see in 2003, uh, which is just a few years after I started working in the field, uh, most countries weren't using something else as their first line re uh, regimen. But already by 2007, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the numbers of countries that had adopted artemisinin-based combination therapy. And really, I can't think in, in history where there's been such a wholesale change in the first line therapy for any infectious disease. Um, and that created a tremendous, tremendous um, drug pressure uh, all at a... a, a um, very close period of time throughout the continent. Um, and the other thing that is uh, obvious to everyone on the, on, the, um, on the platform here is that all of these combinations use some artemisinin derivative together with a partner drug. So you typically either artemether or artesinate or DHA, but for uh, uh, art, artemether and artesinate, those are both, con both converted after um, consumption into DHA. So really, a single type of drug, obviously, and then you combine that with uh, one of these partner drugs that has a significantly long half-life. WHO also recommends using a low um, dose of Primaquin to reduce transmission because these drugs on the left don't really have any significant gametocytocytal effects. So this is really meant to reduce transmission. Uh, but I will say, despite several countries adopting this uh, as an additional measure, very few cases actually receive primaquine. 
So I wanted to um, transition very quickly to a case just to give a sense to folks um, what we uh, deal with in these high transmission settings in, in places like Uganda. Uh, so this was a child that we enrolled in a, in a pharmacokinetic drug efficacy trial uh, about 10 years ago now. They presented uh, with a fever, parasite density of 14,000. We treated them with uh, three days of observed artemether lumefantry and gave them a new bed net at the start of the study. Just about three weeks, just over three weeks later, they came back with a temperature again and a fever of about 10,000. We treated them as, with coartem again as per the standard of care at the time, observing the morning doses of the six dose regimen. 25 days later, they came back to our clinic and our clinic is open seven days a week. Um, uh, and uh, again, they presented with um, fever and parasites of 7,000, treated them again. Six weeks later, treated them again. Um, uh, notably, on October 28th, uh, they presented with 23,000 parasites and had no fever, so were not treated uh, as per standard of care because it's asymptomatic parasitemia. And then again, comes back one more time with malaria. So in the time span of just five months, they had five episodes. And I will note this is in the context of a study where, where all doses, at least in the morning, were, uh, were observed. So this, this really shows uh, the challenges that we, we face in these high transmission settings. So our group has really focused largely on trying to understand various determinants of animal aerial efficacy, toxicity, and resistance. Um, and we try to tackle this from multiple different areas, thinking about co-infections, drug interactions, the impact of malnutrition, which is quite prevalent in these areas. Um, we look at resistance selection, and so how, how does our current use of these ACTs potentially um, uh, uh, foster the, the selection of resistant parasites? Um, and again, we work in these three, three, three countries here, Burkina Faso, uh, Cameroon, and, and um, in Uganda, really high transmission settings. So the first question you, you probably, or one of the questions many of you had uh, looking at that case is, is are these uh, um, new infections or are they recrudescent infections, the terminology we use to denote uh, cases that are occurring uh, due to the same strain? So what's typically done is, is looking at some sort of variable marker. Uh, we use six microsatellites with uh, capillary electrophoresis in the past to at the time of this study to distinguish the strains present on the day of presentation and, and the day of failure. So you can see on the day of initial presentation and enrollment in our, in our trial, they had six distinct strains. They presented then with three strains at the next episode, all new strains. Only at one of these times were they presenting with a recrudescent infection sig signifying potentially a true treatment failure, and whether or not it was resistant to the drug um, uh, really was unclear. But um, overall, I get the sense that uh, these are incredibly high um, kind of force of infection in these areas where individuals are being bitten over and over again uh, by mosquitoes um, carrying parasites. And this figure here on the right is meant to describe, and I'll go back to this figure several times during the presentation, but uh, the darker shaded area is the concentration of the artemether or artemisinin component, which goes away really after about uh, a day uh, after the last dose, even less than a day because of its extremely short half-life for any of the derivatives. But this is followed by a long period of essentially monotherapy that can extend um, uh, for weeks to even months, depending on the partner drug. And, and so this really uh, is a challenging situation whereby uh, you have taken uh, the ACTs and effectively perhaps cleared your initial infection, but there are new parasites continually being inoculated and may be emerging from the liver at a period where the drug concentration is dropping rapidly. You throw on top of that the fact that gametocytes, at least for falciparum, tend to appear in the peripheral circulation um, uh, later um, after presentation, uh, often seven to ten days later, largely because of the bone marrow cycle, um, uh, uh, the development of these uh, gametocytes within the bone marrow before they are released in the periphery. So it's a very complicated PKPD 
situation that is uh, further complicated by the new inoculation of parasites during um, uh, the period after treatment. So another question to ask is, are we just first dosing these kids properly? And, you know, uh, as for most drugs, um, studies are done uh, in, in adults and often then scaled down to, to children um, based on either age or weight um, and not really taking into account changes in organ development and metabolism that occur over that time frame. That's similarly true for pregnancy, um, where we often uh, uh, don't adjust properly for changes that occur in drug um, uh, metabolism and disposition in pregnant women. So um, we started uh, uh, about uh, 17 years ago now doing um, studies in the field uh, to uh, do um, small volume sampling. So at the same time, you see on the right when we're taking a capillary sample, um, we just collected an EDTA coated tube. Um, about 200 microliters of whole blood and then spin that down and use the plasma, which we can use, uh, uh, you know, much less than 100 microliters of, of plasma to then use uh, tandem mass spec to quantify drug samples. So we do these in the context of a lot of our drug efficacy studies now to really understand the PKPD. And so what did we find? You know, unfortunately, um, as have others that work in this sphere, um, pretty much most of the ACTs or several of the ACTs that were most commonly used, notably um, uh, artemethrin, lumefantrin, and DP, um, we are uh, underdosing them in children. And, and um, our work and others uh, with DP demonstrated, particularly those, those at the youngest ages, um, are less, much less likely to attain a target um, uh, piperiquin concentration at a certain point in time. And people often use day seven concentrations as a surrogate for AUC to denote whether or not uh, we are to, to uh, um, assess whether or not we are attaining the concentration that we desire. And you can see um, for AL as well, uh, particularly for those that are low weight for age, uh, the um, uh, day seven concentrations are below the dash line, which is the targeted concentration that a lot of us think uh, is necessary to achieve to attain uh, proper therapeutic efficacy. And this is especially a situation uh, that is of concern in those that are underweight for age. And I think that in, in, in many LMIC settings, this is a particular concern because drugs dosed by um, uh, by weight um, have a higher likelihood of being um, dosed too low if there's uh, high proportions of children that are underweight for age. Um, and uh, these low doses um, or low exposures do lead to a higher risk of uh, reinfection over time. So that, um, you know, for both of these in our, in our follow-up um, of these children, we're able to demonstrate that those that reach uh, that don't reach the thresholds that we ideally want to attain have a higher risk of treatment um, uh, of, of failure due in our setting mostly due to reinfections or new infections. So we're largely thinking about the post-treatment chemoprophylactic effect being different in these settings um, due to the due to the low dosing rather than true treatment failures from um, inadequate treatment of the presenting strain, if that is if that makes sense. So one of the other things we can do with these studies, uh, so once we get the PKPD study, is that we can model what would be a different um, way to do the dosing to attain the concentrations that we want, and that's kind of population PKPD modeling. And here on the left, you can see. Um, and, and again, not proposing that this be done um, for uh, DP in this case, but it just shows you some of the uh, different things you can assess by doing this modeling. So we just wanted to see in the setting where there's high underweight for age, children and in particular young children that were underdosed, if we were to use age-based dosing, would we be able to successfully lower the proportion of children that are um, inappropriately dosed. And yes, age-based dosing would be an effective way to reduce, at least in the youngest age children, um, the potential for underdosing. 
Another thing that we could use uh, modeling for is to understand if we give a regimen in a different way. And again, not 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 proposing that this be done, um, but DP for chemo prevention is is still given in the same way it's given for treatment. So it's given as three consecutive doses on a monthly basis for chemo prevention in places that are trying it out or evaluating it in in sub-Saharan Africa. An issue with uh, the three times a day um, for um, on a monthly basis is I think there's adherence issues for somebody using that regimen on a for a prevention setting where they're feeling fine and asking somebody to take it three days in a row each month may be challenging. Another issue with DP is the piperaquine can be associated with uh, a slight risk of cardiotoxicity or QT prolongation. Um, so we modeled whether or not taking uh, a single dose on a weekly basis instead of three doses on a monthly um, basis, what would that do? And if you model that, you actually achieve lower peak concentrations and a higher steady state um, uh, concentration with the weekly dosing. So probably reduce your risk of toxicity with QT prolongation and maintain higher steady states. And one could argue taking a medicine once weekly may be better received than taking it three days of e the beginning of each month. Uh, so just examples of what can be done with the modeling. So another question would be, um, you know, in this area of Uganda, where uh, currently there's about a 6% prevalence in the countrywide of HIV, um, sadly, um, whether this child uh, that kept getting infections, whether they had some sort of immunocompromised status. Um, this child, thankfully, did not. But um, one area that we're also interested in looking at is the use of um, antiretroviral therapy and what that may do to the efficacy and toxicity of concomitant antiretrovirals. Um, and uh, one of the earliest works we did that's just quite old at this point is um, we looked in the lab to see one of the HIV drugs actually may have antimalarial properties. And this was done almost 20 years ago now, but um, you know, showed that all of the HIV protease inhibitors had anti-malarial activity. And, and at the time, what was fortuitous is that lopinavir atonavir, otherwise known as Kalitra, had the uh, lopinavir component, had amongst the best activity in vitro against various strains of, of uh, falciparum lab strains. And that um, the concentrations that were achieved with dosing in humans, given the concomitant use of ritonavir with lopinavir, led to doses that we thought likely may have some anti-malarial effect when dosed um, uh, in the humans. So um, we looked at this in a clinical trial with colleagues uh, at UCSF and in Uganda, and, and uh, did show, in fact, that folks with HIV on an HIV protease inhibitor-based regimen had lower rates of malaria over time than those on uh, alternative regimens with uh, NRTIs like efavirenz, uh, which was avavirenz and avarapine. What became interesting again is a PKPD story. And this is work that uh, we had shown before in different formats, but this was this particular version was published just this past year, um, looking at the concentration of lumefantrine in these individuals um, in, in a more recent study over time, depending on the concomitant anti-retroviral that they're on. You can see here that those children on a lopinavir ritonavir based regimen had a significantly higher rate of lumefantrine over time versus those that are on efavirenz. And this is due to CYP3A4 inhibition and activation, respectively. So depending on what antiretroviral you are on as a treatment for your HIV, when you get AL uh, or coartem, your lumefantrine concentration is almost three to tenfold different depending on the time after dosing, which leads to significantly lower risks of reinfection over time. And this really can have dramatic impacts on, on one's risk of uh, um, malaria post-treatment in these high transmission settings. Um, I'll skip over this in the interest of time, but I think uh, another, uh, I think, notable finding in this is that um, not only is the partner drug impacted, but the uh, artemisinin component is adversely uh, impacted 
or impacted in different directions depending on the concomitant drug. So you can see here in the uh, control group in the blue line, the artemis, uh, the versus the control group rather, those with um, onifavirenz and nivirapine, which um, at the time of this study and until recently, the last few years, has been the most widely drugs, uh, widely used drugs for HIV therapy in Africa had significantly lower exposure to artemether uh, component over time um, uh, when that regimen was used. So not only is the uh, uh, artemether drug, artemisinin drug uh, exposure changed, but also the partner drug. So one question we had is whether or not we can improve dosing and not just in HIV setting, but mainly in young children. And this is one of the alternative um, uh, approaches that we had been thinking about and others for potentially um, improving our current use of ACTs. And, and our thought was uh, perhaps we should be extending the regimen to five days. Um, and there are you know, obviously pros and cons with extending the COARTEN regimen to five days from three days from an adherence standpoint and a slightly a cost standpoint as well. But um, the only way to increase, increase the lumefantrine concentration because it has dose-limited absorption um, was modeled to be um, uh, by increasing the regimen duration, not increasing the milligram per kilogram given in a single tablet. Additionally, we thought that the additional uh, 48 hours of dosing would expose the parasite to another 48 hours of the artemisinin component. And with the current short half-life of the artemisinin with only 48 hour to 72 hour exposure with a three day regimen, or sorry, 72 hour exposure, 72 hour plus, by giving five days, you, you are more likely to hit at least two complete life cycles, which may be beneficial for the artemisinin component clearance as well. So we did a, a randomized trial, which was recently published this past year called EXALT, Extended AL Treatment in Children in Uganda where we randomized children with and without HIV. Those on HIV were all on efavirenz, which caused the most, most impact on low AL exposure. And we did this in a high transmission setting in southeastern Uganda that has a, a transmission with um, uh, a really high transmission uh, rate. And uh, I think not surprisingly, um, we're able to significantly improve the AL exposure with this new extended regimen, which, uh, you know, is not obviously surprising, um, but just proof of concept um, uh, that that extended regimen did what it should from a PK perspective. I think what was really, I think, sobering, unfortunately, is that our risk of recurrence while at 28 days was nearly significantly um, uh, or approach significance um, in terms of a reduction in recurrence risk in those on the five-day regimen. By 42 days, unfortunately, there's essentially no statistically significant difference um, in recurrence risk at the on the left. So our improvement by five days of extending to five days was very short-lived in this high transmission setting so that by six weeks, uh, that any benefit was really erased by the high transmission intensity and appearance of new parasites um, uh, from recent inoculations. However, um, the extended regimen, if you really look at it from a, a PK perspective, um, much, many more children were able to attain in red uh, uh, um, or, or in blue a level that was deemed to be a target level on day seven. And if you attain that level, you do have a significantly lower risk of recurrence. So um, I think had we had larger sample sizes, we would be able to have demonstrated a, 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 a benefit over time um, uh, with even this regimen. Um, again, uh, what I want to show here is just the massive amount of reinfections. And this is showing in all children, HIV positive or negative, 70% of our children um, uh, had recurrent uh, malaria by 42 days. And this is just using microscopy, so um, uh, an extremely high transmission setting. One other thing I want to just show with the PK, uh, from the PK perspective, is that um, artemether and DHA show uh, this surprising decrease in exposure, which again, we were able to demonstrate in this study. 
that with subsequent dosing, artemether concentrations in these individuals decreased over time. And there's questions as to whether or not in the literature this is due to a disease effect whereby uh, the uh, exposure to the artemisinins um, decreases in time as we go from a disease state to a healthy state due to changes in our overall um, drug disposition um, with uh, uh, returning to health. Um, I think uh, more folks, or a lot of folks, I would say, also believe that auto-induction of CYP3A4 may be um, uh, leading to this decrease. But I think it's a notable decrease that by each subsequent dose in the five-day regimen, you can clearly see that the artemether concentration, uh, or C-max, C two hours post-dosing, rather, uh, decreases over time. And, uh, and what, what the impact of this decrease is uh, on, on resistance and clinical efficacy, I think we don't, we don't know. So um, I know um, I want to be mindful of um, time, so I may go a little bit more quickly here. Um, and I think another area that we wanted to focus on is, is resistance. Um, and, you know, when I started working in the area, I think, you know, most of the artemisinin resistance concern was in Southeast Asia, obviously, um, in the greater Mekong, but unfortunately that situation has now uh, arisen in Africa. Um, and here's just, I think, a nice uh, but sobering figure of when various drugs were deployed and the triangles show how quickly resistance was first detected in, in some location. And you can see really resistance to every drug has occurred extremely quickly. Um, and, and really there's, there's no exceptions to that uh, rule. Um, when we think about resistance, we think about resistance typically in the past arising in areas with low transmission and then spreading into other parts of the world. So uh, the greater Mekong subregion has been a hotbed for the emergence of resistance to several animal aerials historically, namely chloroquine and sulfadoxy and paramethamine in the, in the, in the red and black, uh, the black and red arrows respectively. Um, so that had really been what we thought would be the paradigm that would be followed with artemisinin-based combination therapy. And, and um, so many of us had been just waiting for the arrival of um, artemisinin, which now called partial artemisinin resistance in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and, you know, uh, the story, and I think you've had talks by um, Professor Dondorp, um, and so I won't go into this uh, in excessive detail, but, you know, uh, we all know that the way that this was initially uncovered was by um, noting a slower clearance in the peripheral blood using microscopy in individuals treated with artemisinin-based combination therapies, or in some studies, even um, art, art, artemisinin monotherapy. And uh, they showed that there's presence of parasites in some studies uh, on day three by microscopy, which was is highly unusual, uh, and or just a delay in clearance uh, with a slow half life of greater than five hours, at least in the age in the Asian context. And uh, what was also noted is that several different mutations arose in Southeast Asia, but at one point the C580Y Kelch K13 mutation really seemed to have a sweep. Uh, on the continent. Um, and again, I want to point out here that the Artemis and uh, the PKPD relationship is really critical to think about here, where in the darker uh, green shade here is the Artemis and exposure. And then you have your, um, uh, uh, well, um, uh, you have your uh, very short uh, um, exposure to the Artemis and and then to the long acting partner drug is exceedingly long. So the thought was, well, well, you know, we have partial artemisinin resistance, but, you know, at least the um, partner drugs were working. And that story obviously is is old now at this point, but piperiquin resistance due to plasmepsin 2 copy number and possibly other sites we're learning now, um, together with the K13 mutations really led to the failure of DP uh, throughout this region. And uh, shortly within five to seven years, most of the ACTs in one or more countries have been lost. So um, how does that translate to what we now see in Sub-Saharan Africa? And unfortunately, 
Um, first, the reports in Rwanda occurred a few years ago now, and then this was followed by reports of Artemisin and partial resistance um, with uh, in northern Uganda. And unfortunately, the list just keeps growing as we look more and more. So at the recent TropMed meeting, there was a report of K13 mutations in Tanzania. There's a New England Journal paper now on uh, the story in Eritrea. And, uh, and most recently, uh, uh, descriptions of Artemis and partial resistance in Ethiopia. So really, we're seeing it throughout the Horn of Africa and almost every place that has looked intensively. What I think is most, uh, uh, I think, sobering is that at least from the Rwanda, Uganda, and Eritrea studies, um, population genetics has shown that these did not occur from spread from Southeast Asia. And each of the three cases I just mentioned, population genomic studies suggest that these have arisen independently of one another. And in most of the sites, these mutations that have been most predominant have been distinct not the C580Y or other predominant mutations in the GMS, but they've been distinct mutations that are also leading to this um, uh, uh, phenotype of, of partial Artemis and resistance. So um, what I want to do is return now to the, to the drug story a bit. So what is going on? Um, when we dose the ACTs, as I have said numerous times now, we have a long-acting partner drug. This is just an example from one of our studies where we looked for piperiquin in these individuals at the time they presented with their last, their second episode of malaria in a high transmission site. And in nearly 90% of these children, we were able to still detect piperiquin in their blood at the time they presented with their next episode of malaria after a three-day regimen of DP. So my concern is that in such settings where we have such high transmission and we have long-acting partner drugs, then in successive treatments, you have a situation where you have very low levels of drug present and that this long-acting tail may serve as a resistance selection uh, um, risk. Um, so shifting a bit to um, uh, out of the um, K13 locus, I wanted to look a bit at what we know about um, transporters that may impact some of the partner drug efficacy. So this is something we've been looking at um, and others as well. Uh, to understand how these partner drugs impact uh, mutations in two key transporters that many of us uh, here are quite familiar with. And those are the chloroquine resistance transporter and the multi-drug resistance transporter, so PFCRT and PFMDR1. What is really interesting about these two transporters is that they seem to select, uh, mutations in these two transporters seem to be selected for in opposing directions, depending on the partner drug that you have, such that amodiaquin um, uh, and uh, artemether lumefantrine, uh, so the lumefantrine component most likely and the amodiaquin component seem to select for mutations in different directions. And just to keep it as simple as possible, Lumefantrine selects for the wild type at the K76 locus for PFCRT, as well as the wild type at the N86Y locus of PFMDR1. So both both um, are uh, with lumefantrine are selected for um, the wild type at that locus, whereas amodiaquin selects for uh, the mutant. So they they actually drive selection at these mutations in opposing directions. Um, I will skip over this one. So what we did in the context of a recent study is we looked at when we treat individuals with coartem um, in Uganda uh, and we follow those children and look at the next parasite that they're infected with. And again, very high transmission setting. You can see that 19% of children, when they presented the next time, they changed to a resistant phenotype at the N86Y, so they changed to wild type. 
And at the PFCRT K76 locus, 43% of children the next time they were infected were wild type, infected with a wild type parasite. So in both cases, more than double the chance uh, it was more than double, more than twice likely that an individual was reinfected with a parasite that was wild type at these locus and therefore less susceptible to lumefantrine. I hope that makes sense. Um, we also saw that um, I think what was particularly um, uh, what we were particularly able to do in this study was then compare at what concentration, because this was a PKPD study, what concentration were the wild type um, parasites versus the mutant parasites able to reinfect an individual at. And we were able to demonstrate that those in vivo, the parasites that were wild type at K76 uh, or uh, N86, PFMDR, N86, were able to reinfect uh, individuals at about a three and a half fold higher concentration of residual lumefantrine. So to our mind, this is among the first studies to really show that in vivo, that these parasites with um, that genetic, um, uh, uh, um, with, at, with that um, uh, wild type, at those two loci, we're actually able to reinfect individuals at higher residual lumefantrine concentrations. So I think, you know, we're at a point in Sub-Saharan Africa where we do really need to start thinking about the, the risk of um, uh, emergence of resistance to these ACTs because of the fact that um, we have now partial artemisinin resistance with K13 mutations. We also have a situation where uh, there is evidence of selection for resistance, or it, and again, it should be probably partial resistance for the partner drugs, not res full resistance, because none of these mutations lead to full resistance. Um, but we're at a situation where we may be seeing the loss of, of partner drugs or reduced efficacy at least. And I think the first hints that some of this may be occurring um, have been published now. Um, I think most recently, uh, my old colleagues from UCSF have published IC50 data, at least from northern Uganda, where these K13 mutations are uh, demonstrating that lumefantrine IC50s have actually arisen a little bit from isolates taken from individuals and put into culture. So I'll end now um, just with uh, kind of uh, two, three minutes on, on our surveillance um, work. And I think one of the things that these molecular markers do is they provide us a way to uh, sort of look for drug resistance and really do adequate uh, uh, to do proper surveillance uh, in individual studies, but also more broadly. So one of my PhD students, um, I uh, wanted to look at how well we are doing, particularly at the continent-wide and country-wide um, uh, scale with it just looking for resistance in PFCRT and PFMDR1. So this is kind of a lot to look at on a slide here, but what we did is we looked at, at all published data um, and also looked at sources outside of the published data to see how many publications and surveys have been done for um, resistance at the K at the uh, uh, PFCRT locus and at the um, PFMDR locus across all countries in Sub-Saharan Africa? And the size of the circle denotes either the numbers of the surveys or the numbers of publications. And each country is on the uh, on uh, uh, listed on each row. So you can see there's some countries where you have a lot of surveys being done over time. Um, and though, on the other hand, you have some countries here, and I don't want to pick out individual countries here, but you can see many countries may have one or two uh, surveys done over the entire time period since ACT deployment in 2004 all the way to 2018. Similarly, publications, so when is that data available to the larger, larger um, uh, community? really varies temporally and spatially depending on uh, which country you're in. Uh, 
So one of the other things that we were able to do when we had this is we geolocated as best we could all of the locations for where these surveys were done for partner drug associated um, resistance mutations. And I show here just two examples of countries where the heat map shows the transmission intensity of malaria within a given country with the darker red being more transmission, uh, more high transmission areas and blue being low transmission. In this particular country, you can see that all of the surveys done were concentrated really in the southeast part of the country and none covering the rest of the country um, where most of the transmission was occurring. Here in this country, you can see a lot of the surveys were done in the lowest transmission areas. And again, this is because this is a large city down here and only one survey done in, in that time frame in, in another area in the country. So really, um, uh, I think the goal is really to, to assist um, uh, the community and the countries in identifying where and how often surveys may be needed to be done to really look for the prevalence of key mutations changing over time. I think the other important finding was that there's, on average, uh, the median time to publication from start of a study was 3.1 years. So that is not really going to be an effective surveillance tool. Um, if we are not learning about the data until 3.1 years on average uh, since the study's collected. It, at that point, it's no longer actionable. So we really need to improve the speed of, of our surveillance. Another question is, is, is prevalence of these mutations really cha gonna change or be different spatially across time uh, in a country? And the different colors show different prevalence, um, of a K76 T mutation. So in Ghana, you can see from 2004 to 2009, if you look across the country, the prevalence was actually quite heterogeneous in this time frame. So, you know, in Ghana, I would really argue that we do need to do surveillance at multiple sites and can't just concentrate on one or two sites because the prevalence of the mutations may vary tremendously from one location to the other. You could perhaps extend this Obviously, we don't have data yet to the Artemis mutations that are present in, in country X. Um, uh, maybe just the last one, one or two slides here. I think what else we were able to do with this um, data was then uh, map the evolution and prevalence of these mutations across the continent. Um, and we chose to do this in two big buckets of time. So if you look at the 76T mutation, so the mutation that originally had been thought to be selected for by chloroquine use, um, so 76T is less susceptible to, to chloroquine, um, that mutation in the blue colors is the higher prevalence, so it's nearly universal in some countries. But if you look at the change, it's absolutely dramatic across the continent-wide scale where the K76T mutation now dominates throughout most of Sub-Saharan Africa. So we've seen a continent-wide um, shift in mutation prevalence at this locus. And we've seen a similar dramatic change in MDR, where we see almost all 86Y here, and now most of the African continent has N86, so the wild type, which again is selected for by AL, which is the predominant anti-malarial used um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, with amodioquine being second most widely used. As a control, um, you know, a lot of folks have been interested in the 184 locus at MDR and 1246. You can see there is some slight shift um, in the prevalence over time in this particular, in these two um, uh, um, low, uh, low side, but really the, the major changes were noted in 86 and 76. Um, all right. I think really I'll, I'll end there and just give some time for questions, but I think, you know, um, uh, what we're trying to do is really understand, one, are we using our current ACTs uh, properly? And we think about that from really a pragmatic standpoint is just thinking about the dosing um, and getting it right, particularly in young kids and, and pregnant women so that the child in front of us is treated properly and gets better. But I think, we have to be a little bit more um, sophisticated in our approach and thinking about this and that we have a significant mismatch in the pharmacokinetics of our ACTs with the short acting artemisinin and longer acting partner drugs, and particularly in areas of high transmission, 
this may be an issue in terms of selecting for resistance uh, to one or both of the components. Um, I think there are a lot of all exciting strategies that people are working on. Uh, we had looked at extending a potential regimen, which I think showed some promise, but needs more evaluation. Um, I think the, the kind of uh, uh, most sought after uh, approach right now is the use of triple ACTs, which I didn't talk about, but um, use of combining two partner drugs with artemisinin, which still leaves the mismatch, but at least you have two partner drugs, but there's a lot of hard, um, hurdles to achieve in, in deployment of the triple ACTs, but many uh, amazing groups are working in that field. Um, I think drug resistance is inevitable, and, and we've seen now multiple sites in Sub-Saharan Africa where the artemisinin and partial resistance has now emerged independently and spread within these regions um, from one another. Um, I think our drug resistance surveillance, at least using um, molecular markers, is, is inadequate at the moment, and um, uh, we need to think about how to set up sentinel surveillance sites and do this frequently and get our data out there more quickly so that we can be on top of the situation rather than um, uh, uh, falling behind and needing to, to fix the issue once it's arisen um, and spread to a, to a time, uh, to a level that is, is really hard to recover from. So thanks a lot. Um, I, I apologize again for the late start, but I hope this was thought provoking and I look forward to hearing any uh, questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Parikh, for uh, the wonderful work you have done and uh, you shared with us. So uh, we are sitting at National Institute of Malaria Research, which is an Indian Council of Medical Research institution. Uh, some of other scientists and students have joined from other institutes. We have another institute from BCRC Pondicherry also there. You can take questions. Up. Thanks. Thank you for a wonderful talk. And uh, I have three questions from for you from three components of your talk. Um, the latest one first. Uh, you showed that the surveillance was uh, uh, spatially and temporally inadequate um, in one of your Lancet micro paper. Um, I, I was wondering what, uh, were these uh, individual studies or were these the government surveillance which you spotted? Um, wonderful, wonderful question. And um, so we surveyed um, all of the published literature, um, also used the worldwide anti-malarial resistance network, the WARN database, but also looked uh, for any publications we could find using other search engines outside of PubMed. The challenge is um, most, so there are uh, governments, um, ministries of health clearly, uh, which is wonderful, um, doing uh, surveys um, of drug resistance um, and at different scales and different frequencies. Um, so that data was very hard to come by um, because that data is not in the published literature. Um, and we talk about that in the, in the uh, paper. Um, on the one hand, that's wonderful. And, you know, in some of these uh, countries, this type of surveillance is done in a, in a routine manner and using sentinel sites that were carefully chosen. But um, what I think is still a gap is that most of the time this data is not made available outside of an individual country. So it may be useful to the Ministry of Health, which in some aspects is the most important person to know about this information. However, I think in a situation in Africa, and I think in India as well, when you think about the border with Bhutan, you know, we really want to be sharing information with one another so that we can know uh, what what is developing right across the border. If you look at the current situation in sub-Saharan Africa with partial artemisinin resistance and K13 mutations, I am sure, you know, it's no, it's even though they are showing independent emergence, um, many of the areas where resistance has been detected and, and published out, uh, published on are right at the border region. So I'm sure if country X looked at across, their, uh, uh, across the border, we'd be finding K13 mutations in multiple other countries. It's just that the information is not often shared. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, pretty much. Thank you. Uh, my next concern is that when you, when you, and when we all know that Africa and the sub-Saharan Africa is the center for like very high transmission 
I think it's more than from the GMS region. But why do you think that resistance always emerged from GMS and transfers to Africa? And why is it not the other way around? Yeah, so, you know, I think um, that has been the dogma over time. And I think there's definitely truth to it uh, that resistance emerges in low transmission settings more likely. I think the general thought is in these low transmission settings due to the lack of acquired immunity, most individuals who are infected present symptomatically and therefore are presented with drug at the clinic. Therefore, they have drug pressure. So the overall parasite population in a low transmission setting has a higher risk of being exposed to drug and therefore you have the selective pressure. In a high transmission setting, these resistant parasites, when they arise due to the acquired immunity, um, may be uh, uh, wiped out by the immune system and less likely to be transmitted onward. And also you have more recombination and multiple strains and fitness challenges that kind of compete uh, in these high transmission settings. So that had been kind of the dogma. Um, I think certainly what's happening in East Africa challenges that dogma, at least, at least for this particular K-13 uh, story. The recent publication in New England Journal from uh, uh, my old Uganda um, uh, colleagues have purported, you know, one potential is that at least in the Uganda situation, um, northern Uganda was an area with intense, intense indoor residual spraying for many years, three, four, five years that essentially wiped out malaria in the north there. But once it stopped, um, malaria researched dramatically and, and there's some kind of, you know, um, discussion with no, you know, obviously not able to prove this, but uh, I think in that paper they were uh, suggesting that there was a period of low transmission, low immunity in that setting that might have been a favorable situation for the uh, K13 mutations to arise and spread. However, I've yet to see information from the other countries that have reported K13 in East Africa with to, to kind of support similar types of situations. So I think it's it's more complicated than just the the low transmission, high transmission um, setting. I think it might be, uh, you know, certainly locus dependent um, in that each of these mutations have differing fitness costs. We know that the K76T mutation has a clear fitness cost because it reverted to wild type when chloroquine was re uh, removed, um, whereas the MDR86 does not appear to have a significant fitness cost. So I think those also play into the potential for a mutation to arise and, and be sustained. Um, uh, does that uh, answer the question? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, my last one was that uh, regarding your uh, initial slides mentioning the 13-year-old kid who uh, had those multiple infections. So I was wondering because I, I suppose that uh, the child was part of your trial or you were monitoring the uh, the population. So did you find any similar thing in the siblings or in the family or what was the vector dynamics like? Yeah, it's a wonderful. So this question was a while, you know, a, a while back now, um, just over ten years. Um, um, you know, for this particular child. Um, only one individual in each household was was enrolled in that in that study and followed over time. Um, you know, uh, um, we are doing studies now uh, where we're looking at kind of transmission patterns uh, within households, particularly in in Burkina Faso. And yes, we're finding um, clearly, obviously, is not surprising. And in 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 West Africa and Burkina Faso, where we are, it's it's predominantly Anopheles gambi. Um, with some funestis, um, uh, but overall, you know, likely 90% plus of the bites are coming from Gambia, and you do find clustering within households, uh, certainly. Um, I think interesting work um, in this area has been the use of matching blood meals with individual um, kind of forensic matching of blood meals to the individuals living in the house, and I think uh, I think what's most interesting is in, is that we are definitely seeing biting preference in mosquitoes where where there is um, in many studies now the highest numbers of bites within a household may be occurring in, in kind of school age children. Um, 
Uh, and so um, definitely clustering within households, but also heterogeneity and who's being bitten within, the, within those households. And that is also something we need to take into consideration in our control and prevention efforts. Thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you. Uh, sir, I have two questions. Both are basic questions, actually. I uh, just wanted to know, like, you have uh, shown an example of the child and you have finally come up with the conclusion that underdosing is the issue. So, in the subsequent uh, experimentation, how you ensure that proper dosing is maintained during the, especially in the rural pa patients? Because the yeah. study was for, for days or yeah, you can say uh, weeks. Yeah, well, uh, you said a simple question. I, I think it's a very, uh, it's actually quite a complex question, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, you know, uh, well, I can give you one one positive example, um, and that is with dihydroartemisin and preparaquin, um, where I had the opportunity to work um, on a WHO um, antimalarial dosing um, uh, guideline. So in 2015, they convened for the first time a, a group of individuals to assist in reviewing PKPD relationships for the current ACTs. And together, um, uh, that group was able to take the available data on DP, um, demonstrating the low exposure in youngest children, and actually make a change to the guidelines where we increased the mix per k dosing in the lowest age range. So that that was an example of really, um, it was not easy, um, but making a change with a large enough body of evidence to change the dosing guidelines at the WHO level. It has been harder to do with other drugs. It, it has been changed for um, actually the dosing of our test, uh, artemether um, for severe malaria, but for AL, um, dosing has not yet been adjusted in young children. I think there's still the need for a little bit more of an evidence base um, to make those changes. One of the biggest challenges we occur, and I may be a bit related, uh, I just when you asked about how you would really ensure dosing is maintained at, in the rural level, I think the other big challenge we occur, we encounter everywhere, not in just Africa, but in India and in every location, is that folks feel better after one or two doses often of the animalarial. And I think, um, you know, even though we are trying to improve the exposure um, in the real setting, many times folks are not completing even their, you know, six dose regimen of AL or their three dose regimen of um, uh, AQAS because children really their fever goes away after a day or two and i think this is a an additional challenge and that was certainly with something we worried about with a, extending to a five-day regimen because then you run into adherence concerns even more but um uh i don't have a great answer for that obviously a big um, interest in the drug development world is a single dose therapy a single dose encounter cure uh, where you don't have to worry about that but i think uh I'm not sure how quickly something like that is going to be uh, making it to market. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more question I have. So, as the dosing issue is still a concern, and uh, you have already told, like, after even improvised medication, that uh, the problem of reinfection is still there. So, I just wanted to have, like, if you have uh, Few minutes time just wanted to have what's your opinion about vaccination sure um very quickly on the, the the issue with the reinfection i think you know in an ideal setting um we should be matching two drugs with similar exposure half-lives um and there is work in in drug development and some some are further along in development where we have actually combined two drugs that have a similar half-life and i think that may be a a big advantage um, uh, and, and lower the risk of resistance emergence where we don't have this period of monotherapy uh, with the current ACTs. I think vaccination is um, a development with the RTSS and R21 um, availability in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, obviously, 
production and deployment is going to be a significant challenge. Um, but I think the biggest, uh, I think it's one of our one of our tools in our toolkit. Um, you know, with RTSS showing perhaps around 30% efficacy, and maybe it's a little bit better for the R21 vaccine. Um, clearly, it's not going to be the end all be all uh, um, uh, story to to really get better control of malaria. But I think the way we use the vaccine um, is going to have to to vary depending on the epidemiology of the location. I think, for instance, in areas with seasonal malaria, as many of you have seen, I think. What seems to be very effective is using the vaccine in a seasonal way. So seasonal malaria chemo prevention, where we give it at the beginning of the transmission season with SMC, with amidiquine SP. So you give both the drug for chemo prophylaxis and the vaccine, and there you're really able to drive down malaria rates. Um, but vaccine by itself so far, I think, is, is going to help. But in these high transmission settings, maybe you go from four episodes down to two episodes or, or three episodes. And if you're lucky, down to one episode, but it's not gonna really um, wipe out malaria from these from these tra high transmission settings. So again, I think it has a role, very exciting. We need to improve further on the efficacy like the R21 seems to have done, um, but we need more data still on the R21 as well. Um, uh, but it it's needs to be combined with other interventions to really make a, a noticeable um, impact on, on our disappointing trajectory over the last four or five years. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for the uh, excellent presentation. So my question is uh, totally different. It's related to the case presentation you had uh, shared to us about that boy with the uh, multiple infection. Sir, I just want to know Sir, actually, you have already said that the vector was uh, Anopheles gambi. But, sir, did uh, during your study period, did you gather the knowledge or data about the vector density, the insecticide which you use, or is there any insecticide resistance for there? Anything such data was studied during that time? Uh, so, um... And apologies if I wasn't clear when I was talking about it, Anopheles Gambia and Prunastis, I was I was then had shifted to our work in West Africa. So this uh, this case presentation of this child was actually in Uganda, and at that point we hadn't been doing vector related work. My colleagues in Uganda are now looking at the vector. Most of our vector work, and we're doing um, a good amount, as is in Burkina Faso. In in that setting, if uh, you permit me to, to shift to that setting, because it's it's again also an area with high transmission where we see incredible recurrent rates. So it's it's a similar situation. I think the main difference in Burkina Faso is that the malaria season is 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 about a four to five month time frame, whereas in Uganda it's it's perennial with seasonal peaks. But in West Africa, where we've been looking at the vector density, it is. It is again. It's predominantly Anopheles gambiae, and and uh, with a small contribution of Funestis. And in that setting, we have extremely high rates of pyrethroid resistance, almost universal pyrethroid resistance. So even though bed net use is widespread, and and you know when you do surveys, everybody says they use a bed net, um, but obviously we know that actual use is is lower because it's hard to hard to sleep under a bed net consistently. Um, but the pyrethroid component, permethrin, um, uh, pyrethroid component in the bed nets in that region is essentially ineffective. So they're deploying new bed net chemistries like clofenapyr, alpha um, and PBO nets in that region. And they are showing efficacy, significantly superior efficacy. But some of the data that I've seen emerging is that the, the length of effectiveness of these bed nets with the alternative chemistries doesn't seem to be as as um, as long a duration as we are hoping for. So I think there there needs to be some work on the um, actual formations of these in terms of the kind of the insecticide um, uh, chemistries in these bed nets because 
we are seeing some loss of e efficacy already by the second and third year, um, which could be either just lost of the um, component in the bed nets um, or the development of, of resistance. Um, but you know that's just early days in this in this area. Uh, we have uh, another institute which is uh, Vector Control Research uh, Center in Pondicherry. So they have joined us, and I I will read uh, you know one or two questions on their behalf. So their question is: How do you justify low exposure is associated with high rate of malaria? Um, can you read that one more time? Yeah. So question is: How do you justify low exposure? is associated with high rate of malaria? Um, if I'm understanding the question, um, you know, so we do this through our, our uh, drug, lever, drug level measurements following the children over time and looking at um, whether or not the AUC area under the curve or a particular concentration threshold that's reached on day seven is associated with the child or, or pregnant woman returning to the clinic with another episode of malaria. Um, and uh, so we are able to demonstrate that folks who reach a certain threshold or don't reach a certain threshold have a higher risk of repeat infection over time. In our setting, thankfully, at this point, these recurrent infections are, and we can determine this by fingerprinting the parasites, are overwhelmingly due to new infections and not due to the same strain present at the beginning actually causing that failure. So it's not due to yet uh, once resistance really takes hold, that situation may may change, will likely change. But at the moment, when we are doing our studies, the exposure response relationship is really focused on the post-treatment prophylactic period because of the high rates of reinfection. So low exposure in our setting, because K13 mutations are just emerging, et cetera, we're not seeing actual resistant failure, recrudescent infections, we're seeing a shorter duration of prophylaxis from the long-acting partner drug over time. So I hope that's clear, and I hope that's what the individual was asking. Yeah. So another question from them is, uh, you talked about surveillance. The surveillance is with respect to vectors or fever cases? Um, so I think in all cases, we need to do a better job. Um, uh, you know, one thing I would, I would, so when, when we mapped our data, we were looking at any published data from surveys, looking at individuals with or without symptomatic malaria that reported on mutation prevalence for PFMDR or PFCRT. So that's what we searched for, basically any, any publication on that. So it wasn't focused just on fever individuals with clinical uh, disease, um, and we were not looking at vector-related research. There has been uh, a publication looking at resistance surveillance on the insecticide in, in the African continent. I think one thing I'd love to see, and, and it's happening in many countries, you know, just they're unbelievably fantastic ministries of health and vector control divisions in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, what I think would be um, you know, another important point in these settings is just to really improve the communication between the vector control divisions and the and the folks looking at the drug resistance surveillance and really leveraging information um, and, and combining that information into really one story over time um, and maybe taking advantage. We recently published uh, some work this past year in um, uh, Lancet microbe looking at the potential use of mosquitoes uh, for xeno surveillance. So that is another aspect where we we are excited and pursuing is whether or not we can use um, track use mosquitoes themselves as a way to track the prevalence of malaria in areas, um, but also achieve information on vector species um, and uh, insecticide resistance. All kind of one stop shopping. So 
in interest of time, we would like to conclude this session here. And uh, we will have some questions, so we'll, we may email you and you may apply Please. after that. And so with this, I thank you very much uh, for you to join us in your odd hours. Thank you for all the participants. And I'm sure you might be aware this is a festival time in India. So we wish you all, uh, you know, happy Diwali and a safe Diwali. Uh, happy Diwali to everyone. And uh, we'll connect uh, next month with the, with the 12th lecture of this lecture series. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>